world, the world's writers will walk through those gates. And uh, if you hang around, you get a chance to talk to them. I'm interested in conversations that deal with things that matter, that real, you know, how do we live our lives? First of all, make climate change personal in your life. The second step is get angry and get active. And the third step, and believe it or not, I think this is the most important. We have to imagine this world that we want to hurry towards. But kindness is looking at people as people and not as, I voted this, I do this, whatever it is. There are some people we will never get along with, but most of us, most of us are a complex mass of different things. I hope you enjoy your events in this year's digital programme and that they spark in you thoughts and conversations and feelings. All the things that a good book should do and all the things that a wonderful book festival like Edinburgh International Book Festival does too. It's a book festival that's really dear to my heart. It's one of the first festivals I attended as a new author. I was part of their Outriders Africa programme and every year returning to it feels a little bit like coming back to a literary home. It's such a pleasure to see them going online this year, and I'm so excited for the future of Edinburgh International Book Festival. We are the Open University in Scotland. We are open to everyone, regardless of previous qualifications, background or location. I didn't think about going to university. It wasn't really an option for me at the time. I left school with no qualifications. At the OU, our courses and apprenticeships are designed so our students can fit their studies around their busy lives. The Open University in Scotland. Your ambition, our mission. Hi everyone, good evening and thank you so much for joining us for what is sure to be a brilliant conversation. My name is Jade Bentle and tonight I will be chairing this conversation on Critical Reflections on Feminism, an event sponsored by the Open University of Scotland. Tonight I am joined by two brilliant Black feminists who are really writing, thinking and reimagining the possibilities that you know Black feminist politics have for our world. So I'm going to introduce them both. So I'm joined by Lola Olufemi and Mina Salami. So Lola Olufemi is a black feminist writer, organizer and Stuart Hall Foundation scholar from London. Her work focuses on the uses of the feminist imagination and its relationship to political demands and futurity. She is the author of Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power and a member of Bare Minimum, an interdisciplinary anti-work arts collective. And Mina Salami is a Nigerian, Finnish and Swedish feminist theorist and writer. She is the founder of Miss Afropolitan and the author of Sensuous Knowledge, a Black feminist approach for everyone, which explores topics such as art, beauty, identity, blackness and womanhood with an African centred and feminist paradigm of knowing. She graduated from SOAS, University of London, with a distinction in gender studies, where she specialised in black feminisms for her master's degree. She is a co-director of the feminist movement Activate and sits on the advisory board of the African Feminist Initiative at Pennsylvania State University and the editorial board of the Interdisciplinary Journal for the Study of the Sahel, 
Thank you so much for joining me this evening, ladies. So I did want to just begin uh, with you both reading out a section from each of your books just to truly ground this session in a kind of, you know, black feminist kind of praxis, I guess. So I want to start off with Lola, if you could kind of read out a section from Feminism Interrupted. Thank you so much, um, Jade. Thank you to the Edinburgh Book Festival for having us. Um, I'm going to read some bits and bobs from the introduction of the book. Um, yeah, so I'll start. Feminism opened up my world. I saw in it conflicting theorists and activists all giving their ideas about the way the world should be. Perhaps most memor memorably, it released me from the desire to comply with the world as is. This meant many things to me as an individual. Feminism allowed me to be wayward, the wrong kind of woman, deviant. It took me longer to realize that true liberation meant extending this newfound freedom beyond myself. Just because I felt freer in some respects did not mean I was free. The material conditions of my life were still determined by the same systems. Poverty and racism still trapped the women around me. Disparities in healthcare, education, public services, and access to, to resource limited the possibility for any kind of expansive existence. I saw how black women were locked out of womanhood as defined by white supremacy and how anyone outside of those accepted boundaries simply did not exist in the eyes of the mainstream. I began to understand how my own rebellion, the defiance instilled in me by the feminist I admired, was raced and classed. I read about how freedom requires upheaval and must be fought for, not romanticized. It was during this period that I realized that feminism was not simple. There were no pre-given solutions. The answer, if there was one, required us to place different feminisms in conversation and necessitated a radical flexibility in our organizing. Feminism was complicated and messy in ways that made me reconsider my foundational political beliefs, equality versus liberation, reform versus abolition. Feminism meant hard work, the kind done without reward or recognition, the kind that requires an unshakable belief in its importance, the kind that is long and tiresome, but that creates a sense of purpose. It proposed a new way of being that transformed the way that I looked at the world. The feminist I admired argued that the abolition of all prevailing systems of violence was crucial to any feminist future. They called for a revolution in the way that we think about ourselves and others, their critiques of the state, capitalism, the family, white supremacy, sex and education, encouraged in me a rejection of what was expected. They provided a place to say the unsayable. Bell Hooks writes about how she came to theory desperate, wanting to comprehend, to grasp what was happening around and within me. The same can be said for many young women who come to theory to be given a blueprint for a better world, who come to theory looking for a way to be changed. There's a divide playing out in the mainstream. The emergence of neoliberal feminism or boss girl feminism driving many contemporary discussions clashes with the radical and critical vision of feminism. Broadly speaking, neoliberalism refers to the imposition of cultural and economic policies and practices by NGOs and governments in the last three to four decades that have resulted in the extraction and redistribution of public resources from the working class upwards, decimated infrastructures of social care through auster austerity measured, privatized the welfare state and individualized the ways we relate to one another. The neoliberal model of feminism argues that inequality is a state that can be overcome in corporate environments without overhauling the system. It centralizes the individual and their personal choices, misguidedly imagine, imagines that the state can grant liberation, seeks above all to protect the free market and fails to question the connection between capitalism, race and gender depression. This model of feminist thought is most appealing to those who have a limited knowledge of radical history and the games fought and won by activists who dared to demand what was once deemed impossible. The consumerist promise of success that neoliberal feminism offers is hollow because it, it is a superficial promise made only by those who can access it. White feminist neoliberal politics focuses on the self as a vehicle for self-improvement and personal gain at the expense of others. We're instructed by corporate talking heads to lean into a capitalist society where power equals financial gain. This model works best for wealthy white women who are able to replace men in a capital structure. In this approach, there's no challenge to hegemony, only acquiescence. The boardroom has become a figurative battleground upon which many stake their feminist aspirations. If we are to challenge this, we must ask what about the fate of the low-paid women who clean the boardrooms and what makes their labor so expendable? A feminism that seeks power instead of questioning it does not care about justice. 
The decision to reject this way of thinking is also a decision to reject easy solutions. We all have to ask ourselves at some point, who will I be and what will I do? What can my politics help me articulate? What violence will it expose? Feminism provokes a kind of feeling, a reaction, a repulsion in the eyes of its detractors, and rightfully so. There are men who have built their careers on deriding us. Media outlets that gleefully malign the seriousness of the task at hand. How should we think about the world remains one of the most important, frustrating, joyful questions to answer because it requires a recognition that our lives, our fate, our successes and disappointments are all connected. When we do feminist work, we are doing the kind of work that changes the world for everybody. It's important to feel free, but it's more important to make sure that we get free socially, politically, economically, artistically. Here we see why the decision we make early on about what kind of feminist we will be is so important. It is vital to correct the misinformation about what it means to be a feminist in theory and in practice. Imagine this, a world where the quality of your life is not determined how, by how much money you have. You do not have to sell your labor to survive. Labor is not tied to capitalism, profit or wage. Borders don't exist. We are free to move without consequence. The nuclear family does not exist. Children are raised collectively. Reproduction takes on new meanings. In this world, the way we carry out dull domestic labor is transformed and nobody is forced to rely on their partner economically to survive. The principles of transformative justice are used to rectify harm. Critical and comprehensive sex education exists for all from an early age. We are liberated from the gender binary strangling grip and the demands it places on our bodies. Sex work does not exist because work does not exist. Education and transport are free from cradle to grave. We are forced to reckon with and rectify histories of imperialism, colonial exploitation and warfare collectively. We have freedom to, not just freedom from. Specialist mental health services and community care are integral to our societies. There is no state as we know it. Nobody dies in suspicious circumstances at its hands. No person has to navigate sexism, racism, disabilism, or homophobia to survive. Detention centers do not exist. Prisons do not exist, nor do the police. The, the military and their weapons are disbanded across nations. Resources are reorganized to adequately address climate catastrophe. No person is without a home or loving community. We love one another without possession or exploitation or extraction. We all have enough to eat well due to the redistribution of wealth and resource. We all have the means and the environment to make art if we so wish. All cultural gatekeepers are destroyed. Now imagine this vision not as utopian, but as something well within our reach. Whew. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading. I absolutely love that passage. I remember when I was reading your book a few months ago, just kind of reading that in passage, I was like, yes, <laughs> it's <laughs> possible. So thank you so much. Minna, I'm going to move over to you. If you could please bless us with a passage from your beautiful book too. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for the introduction, Jade. And I also want to thank the Edinburgh um, International Book Festival for having us and Lola for that powerful and important um, vision. It's, it, it's really amazing. Um, so I'm going to read from Sensuous Knowledge from the introductory chapter. In the beginning, there was only the sky, the sea, and the gods. Olokun was the sea goddess, and Olorun was the sky god. One day, Obatala, the god of creativity, asked the sky god if he could create land and living creatures to alleviate his boredom. Olorun approved, and Obatala created Ife, the great city that remains the cradle of Yoruba civilization. However, when Olokun found out that Obatala had created earth and land in her territory without consulting her, she retaliated with a great flood that inundated the first city of humankind. Eventually, Ife was rebuilt, and it became the Ondaye, the place of creation, Orirun, the source of life, and Ibiyoju Timowa, the place from where the sun or enlightenment rises, as the eminent professor Banji Akintoye describes Ife in a history of the Yoruba people. But the luminous strength of feminine wisdom was out of balance in the new Ife, and the genders were locked in an eternal power struggle. To prosper, the people received Ogbon, which refers to knowledge or phronesis, which is practical wisdom. However, the gods knew that Ogbon had to affect the minds and the hearts of the people. So they divided Ogbon into Ogbon Ori and Ogbon Inu, concepts that literally translated mean 
knowledge of the head and knowledge of the gut, but that respectively refer to intellectual intelligence and emotional intelligence. To have only one type of knowledge, according to the Yoruba ethos, was to be only partly wise. Just as Ogbon Ori and Ogbon Inu together form Ogbon, so too are intellectual and emotional intelligence two sides of the same coin of knowledge. But throughout modern history, the dominant belief is that all worthy knowledge is rational and logical. The prevailing dogma is that all valid ways of knowing are strictly assessed by the cognitive skills of reasoning, quantification, and deductive inquiry. And so from a young age, those with the best grades in subjects involving rationality and logic, mathematics, science, chemistry, and so forth, are graded the most intelligent. In fact, the mere tradition of ranking children is a result of this mode of thinking. As adults, we continue to evaluate intelligence according to rateable and hierarchical processes. We do not view knowledge as something that can be accessed and assessed through the arts and their connection to the emotions, senses, and embodied experience. We associate talent with the arts, but not knowledge. Yet art is also suited to explaining reality because art captures reality from the inside out. Art explains who we are because our existence is artful. We are not simply rational and mental beings. We're also emotional and physical beings. Art is a way to understand and change reality just as much as quantifiable information is. This is why Ogbon had to speak to both the intellect and the emotions. Stories turn into knowledge and knowledge transforms into matter. The dualist worldview separates matter from story, but narrative is the matter from which we build our worldview, which in turn becomes physical objects, books, buildings, borders, and so on. In our bodies, knowledge also transforms into matter. Just as the first structure that forms in the human embryo is the spinal cord, so too is knowledge the spine of all other ideas that shape our lives. How we move and feel in the world, the air we breathe, the health of our trees, the food we eat, the ideologies we support, the way we dance and make love are all reflections of what we know. The idea that calculable reasoning is the only worthy way to explain reality is one of the most dangerous ideas ever proposed. Our approach to knowledge has become fundamentalistically rule-bound and rigid. Civilization thirsts for humanistic thinking as the Sahara is thirsty for water. The more robotic society becomes, the more social problems there are, which then once again encourages more surveyable diagnostics. As always, the poorest in society pay the highest price for this assessment-obsessed dynamic. In the UK, councils are increasingly using algorithms to make decisions about social welfare. Everywhere, rule set computable, computable methods increasingly make key decisions about people's complex realities, leaving those who most need to be listened to in the hands of a computer's authoritative verdict. The incapacity to listen serves to suppress feeling, which results in toxicity because it overlooks actuality. The reason why the most violent people tend to be male is because the social education teaches men to repress their emotions. The repression of emotions always leads to violence, both physical and non-physical, both toward oneself and others. We need an approach to knowledge that synthesizes the imaginative and rational, the quantifiable and immeasurable, the intellectual and the emotional. Without feeling, knowledge becomes stale. Without reason, it becomes indelicate. We need an approach that measures wisdom not only by science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, SEM, or gross domestic product, GDP, but also by how ethically we develop our societies. We need knowledge that affects the interior as well as the exterior, Ogboninu and Ogbon Uri, sensuous knowledge. By sensuous, I don't mean sensual, while sensuality is related to bodily appetites and self-indulgent pleasure involving the physical senses, touch, taste, sight, smell, and hearing, sensuousness transcends the instincts. When something is sensuous, it affects not only your senses, but your entire being, your mind, body, and soul. Books are sensuous, for example. You can see, touch, and smell them. You can hear them in audio format and taste their words on your tongue. 
Books are tangible objects of myriad textures, aged, hardback, hand-stitched, and so on. They are mentally stimulating, therapeutic, and they potentially transform your deepest thought patterns. When the poet John Milton coined the term sensuous in his 1644 tractate of education, it was precisely to avoid the sexual connotation in the word sensual. And so he described his genre, poetry, as one that was simple, sensuous, and passionate. Sensuous knowledge is thus a poetic approach. It is the marriage of emotional intelligence with intellectual skill. It is perceiving knowledge as a living and breathing entity rather than as a packaged product to passively consume. It is encountering knowledge as a partner rather than a servant or a lord for that matter. It means treating knowledge as precious so that it can hone you into an embodiment of its merit. Sensuous knowledge is knowledge that infuses the mind and body with aliveness, leaving its impact behind like the wake of perfume. It is knowledge that is pliable and not hard as rocks. It means pursuing knowledge for elevation and progress rather than out of an appetite for power. Wow, thank you so, so much, Mina. That was such a gorgeous passage. So I did just want to kind of, I guess, begin the questions. So, you know, just to begin with you, Minna, you are, you know, throughout your book, Sensuous Knowledge, you are arguing for this approach. Um, I think I remember reading a really, really gorgeous line that kind of was something like, I'm arguing for the eroticization of knowledge. Um, and I, you know, just reading that, kind of hearing that passage and having read it myself, what really struck me was how, you know, you are arguing for sensuous knowledge, but also that kind of um, sensuality, so to speak, is kind of embodied in the writing as well. So I did just want to kind of ask you, you know, in terms of this idea of Europatriarchal knowledge versus sensuous knowledge, how did you kind of come into kind of theorizing these different terms of reference? And I guess, you know, if you could just expand on what, you know, an approach of sensuous knowledge has to kind of offer us. Great. Um, yeah, uh, I, I do go on later in the same chapter that I just read from to, to, to declare that I'm not like denouncing sensuality or um, anything erotic and that in fact, uh, sensuous knowledge is a kind of eroticization of knowledge, as you say. Um, so I guess uh, in, in terms of your patriarchal knowledge, I, I just need to give you a little bit of context. So where um, uh, most feminist books, um, you could say, are working toward radicalizing the reader politically. Um, I realized when I started writing Sensuous Knowledge that I wanted to do more than that. I wanted to, to radicalize the reader politically, but also to, um, to kind of awaken them inwardly. Um, and the reason for that was because, uh, you know, when, when you are politically radicalized, it is not necessar necessary that you then sort of embody the message of what you've been politicized into. And so I thought that this, this you know, two prismed approach was necessary. Um, and then as I started writing, I, I, it, it, it happened intuitively, but as I thought about like, how will I go about doing this kind of, you could almost call it a psychoactive approach to a, a text. Um, I figured that I would need to, to involve multiple prisms. Um, so what I did was uh, I combined academic study with storytelling, um, poetry and politics, uh, you know, looking at science and art, my headphones, I need a new pair of headphones. <laughs> um, uh, combining science and art as sources of knowledge. Um, and it was this, this, um, this sensibility. Um, so, because it's not just about combining multiple perspectives, but also bringing a, a specific type of sensibility toward doing that. Um, and that is what I refer to as sensuous knowledge. Um, but in order for me to kind of develop it even further, I, I needed to, to declare and to, to theorize and build upon what sensuous knowledge is in contrast to, and that is um, where Europatriarchal knowledge comes in. Um, so because sensuous knowledge is basically uh, emanating and rooted in, in a black feminist genealogy, because a lot of the, 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 the components of sensuous knowledge are things that black feminists have been advocating for decades. Um, and so Europatriarchal knowledge instead is, is 
rooted in uh, Eurocentric and patriarchal genealogy, as the, the phrase implies. And, um, and in contrast to sensuous knowledge, it is a type of knowledge production which focuses on um, creating destructive hierarchies and uh, reductive binaries. Um, and so, and I, I engaged and I build and developed this, this concept, your patriarchal knowledge, not so much to critique it, even though that becomes an inherent element of what I'm doing in the book, but um, actually more so to expose it, to dismantle it, because to dismantle uh, really just means to remove the mantle, to, re to, to, to see something clearly. And in order to change our reality, we need to really see it clearly. So I wanted to get into the depth of your patriarchal knowledge, how it began, and the ways in which it uh, continues to manifest in our society today. Thank you so much. I did want to move on to Lola. Um, you know, having kind of just spoken about kind of your patriarchal knowledge and kind of black feminist ways of knowing and kind of reimagining the world. What really struck me about your introduction when I was reading it was, you know, like I said, that really beautiful passage where, you know, I think you're really kind of theorizing the possibilities of abolition. Um, and, you know, I know you kind of kind of explore various different subjects throughout the book. But what I thought really kind of grounded it, um, you know, throughout all of the chapters was this idea of abolition, you know? So I just kind of wanted you to speak a bit more about how you came into a specific kind of black feminist abolitionist praxis. And, you know, if you could define abolition for us as well. Um, that's an excellent, that's a really good question. I feel like just to kind of um, jump off of what Minna was saying, um, this idea of, uh, Black feminism in particular offering different ways of knowing and different like epistemologies I think is so incredibly like important and I think is very linked to the question around abolition. Um, the way I kind of came to I guess an abolitionist politic um, was definitely through black feminist thinking. I was like lucky enough when I was a university student to be part of a symposium where Angela Davis and Gina Dent kind of reflect on their work specifically around abolition and specifically this idea Gina Dent spoke about um, like how do we talk about women in prison without putting them in another kind of cage right theoretically or, or otherwise um, and so and um, the way that I think about abolition is, is probably best um, articulated through uh, Ruthie Gilmore which is the same for most people this idea of questioning or uh, chain or transforming the conditions by which prisons and policing and other forms of oppressive social organization became the answer to social problems, right? So I like to think of um, abolition as closely tied to a politics of abundance and a politics of living, meaning what would it mean um, to not um, develop a politics that that relies on somebody being dead, right? We're always talking about justice after the fact, justice for X person who has died at the hands of the state or the hands uh, at the hands of the police. And I think what abolition is is about is about one rethink finding ways to rethink how we deal with harm um, in our um, societies and in our communities, but also enabling um, and and creating and building the conditions through which we, we might be able to flourish, so that the thing that we understand stand as crime, the thing that we understand, um, um, those, those kind of discourses are rendered kind of impossible. So the prison becomes impossible in, in, um, in thought and in actuality. Policing becomes impossible in thought and actuality. And I think, you know, in this moment we're seeing, we're seeing abolition really enter like mainstream conversations. And it's, you know, not, not at all initially because of like hegemonic ideas in society and because of the way that we've been taught that justice, quote unquote justice operates, it, it can be um, a political frame that really challenges what you understand about the world that you want to live in. And so it's not necessarily um, an easy one to come to, but I, I think of abolition as an end to the world as we know it, right? And for me, that's a, that's a very exciting principle. And I think that the most critical and the most radical feminists have been making that argument for decades, right? Like embedded in their work is this central idea that we could live better than the way that we, that, than the way that we do currently. And how do we begin to enact those futures that we want to see 
um, in the moment that we're in. And so abolitionist organizing is all about thinking about ways that we, you know, might um, address harm without involving the state, without involving carceral politics, without uh, assuming that just because we make a law about something, the problem goes away and, and um, so so forth. And also central to, to the that kind of frame, the last thing I'll say is this idea that prison, uh, prisons, policing, et cetera, cannot be reformed or tweaked or changed, that they're fundamentally violent institutions. And so they must go and in their, in their um, kind of, in the in the wake of of um, the disappearance of those of the rendering of a, impossible of those institutions, we have a chance to really build and and yeah to really think about the way we want to live. I guess. Thank you so much. Mm. I'm so glad that you um, kind of mentioned the end of the world as we know it, because mm. of course that's kind of like I guess a grounding principle of Black feminism, and I see it kind of you know spoken about, theorized about, you know more and more, especially in the wake of, you know, COVID-19, mm -hmm. wake of seeing, you know, all the uprisings with Black Lives Matter. So I did want to ask you, Minna, you know, in the book, you have a chapter about decolonization, which is also, you know, I think in terms of, you know, when we're thinking about Black feminism, when we're theorizing Black feminism, it's also about the end of the world as we know it. It's about these terms of kind of abolition and how we can kind of, I guess, build or remake the world anew. So I did just want to ask, you know, I guess over the past, five years or so, we've seen, you know, decolonization become a bit of a buzzword, you know, it's become kind of embedded within kind of university structures, you know, it's kind of become a word that people throw around and, you know, arguably has lost its kind of, you know, radical root. You do argue in the book for a decolonial feminist approach. So I did just want to kind of ask you to expand on that, um, I guess, within the frame of sensuous knowledge and how we can kind of view, yeah, decolonization in that sense. Thank you. Um, I just want to uh, piggyback off the conversation before. Before I speak about um, a decolonial feminism, just in case I don't get a chance to say this, because I think it is really important to emphasize how, you know, the past five or six months or so, like the, co the conversations that we're having about how, you know, about essential workers, about the, 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 the neglect of low income groups, um, about the neglect of unions, um, about climate change and the Black Lives Matter protest that erupted, which I think is absolutely connected to lockdown, to the pandemic um, and how that has got us talking about race. Um, the, the, the past few months have had us talking about gender in ways that we haven't in a long time um, and really like understanding how the lack of a gender critic, not gender critical, gender egalitarian, that means something else these days, um, a gender egalitarian approach in the sciences, for instance, means that we haven't been able to understand why so many more men um, have died from COVID than, than women, which is, you know, really vital information. And basically, all of these conversations point to how um, interconnected this present moment is and all of the struggles and all of the issues that we're seeing. And so basically, the conversations that we're having at the moment are Black feminist conversations because Black feminists have been talking about the interconnectedness of struggle and of political realities um, for so long in a way that you know the rest of the world is now starting to do. And so it, it isn't about like who owns an idea. Um, I, I raise this simply because, um, because it is pretty simple. It is about like making sure that we now listen and we now engage with the work of black feminists because we've been talking about these intersectional issues um, for such a long time. Um, and yeah, decolonization is absolutely, um, very much tied to, to everything that has just been said. Um, and I guess, you know, you're right. It is, it is becoming a buzzword. It has become a buzzword. And of course, when that happens, there's always a risk of co-opting um, of the, the radical message being diluted. Um, and I do see a lot of that happening. Um, also, I mean, not only because of the mainstream media interest in the term and institutions that are everything but decolonial using the term, um, but also in the way that we approach the decolonization project, which I would argue is um, very often in a kind of Euro patriarchal knowledge way. Um, so looking at decolonization in a kind of uh, linear methodical way, right? Um, as if we can, as if the prefix D means to like amputate uh, the wrong kind of 
colonize thoughts from our minds or as if we can uh, you know, take some kind of pill and become decolonized and then do like a, a test, like some kind of biometric test to measure how decolonized we are. And what that then results in is a sense of chaos and, um, and censorship and paranoia because it becomes this very typical of Europatriarchal knowledge production, this thing where we're like comparing, like, am I as, is my mind as decolonized as your mind and which institution is more decolonized than the other. And so I, um, I take a slightly different approach in my book. Um, and I argue that uh, decolonization is, is uh, you know, it's, it's, it has to be something that brings uh, kind of unity and, and calm and mindfulness um, to the mind, to our institutions, to our politics, um, because that is a kind of uh, aware and complex center that we need to be operating from. Um, and so in a sense, rather than like doing away with things, I, uh, decolonization is creating uh, kinds of like hybrids of sorts. Uh, and so I, I use the metaphor of if decolonization were a, a garden, um, we're kind of approaching it more like trying to cut off all the, the poison ivy and any plants that we don't like and then creating very strict, rigid um, compartments in the garden, whereas actually decolonization is, um, it, it's more a process of like mixing all the plants and seeing if they create interesting hybrids and, and just really observing um, the ugliness and the beauty in this, in this garden that is our reality um, and, and moving on from there. So much that was so beautiful I, mean, I, I just like got compliments for days this evening <laughs> so um you know kind of sticking I guess with this idea of decolonization with this idea of abolition I did want to ask you Lola you know one of the chapters in your book is about the relationship between feminism and food um and I think I was saying to you earlier I've just never seen these kind of different connections being made between I guess you know this kind of relationship, you know? You explore fat phobia, you exp um, explore the kind of gender division of labor within households in terms of cooking. You then talk about kind of, you know, climate change and I guess the agricultural kind of industry in terms of women in the global South and food. So I did just kind of wanted to, um, I kind of wanted to ask you to just expand on, I guess, you know, the relationship between feminism and food and how that, I guess, figures within the, you know, greater kind of project of abolition um, and decolonization? Um, I think that um, kind of, uh, I'll answer by way of kind of pig piggybacking um, off what Minna said in terms of, what, what I think is really interesting about Minna's book is, is the way that it takes seriously how politics exists on different registers. So this idea that poetry can, can tell us um, uh, a lot about the way we live in the same way that we would think about sociology or other more kind of legitimate and or formalized disciplines, right? And I think that that was kind of the approach that I wanted to take when thinking about food, because when we when we think about food, maybe we think about food in very specific ways. We think about it as a very individualized thing. We think about our dinner, we think about the things that we eat and the way that our personal relationship to our body. And in in attempting I guess to shift the register of the conversation um or complicated it a bit I wanted to make attempt to make the argument that perhaps um the, everything that we're feeling individually um as women as, as non-binary people about our bodies as people in general um is connected also to the material conditions um in in which our food is made and produced right that uh the kind of uh, machinery of exploitation that creates agriculture, that creates um, food, um, and the exploitation that's embedded in that in terms of workers having little to no rights, agricultural workers, in terms of union busting, um, that happening in specific places, in terms of how people who are uh, who draw attention to land dispossession in places like Canada, um, uh, uh, Canada and um, uh, uh, South America, sorry, um, Canada and South America are disappeared by the state and mysteriously go missing. Those are all connected to 
um, the food that we eat, the, the food that we eat, and therefore the relationship that we have to our bodies. And so, in order to kind of do away with this neoliberal idea that we are singular beings and our bodies are representations of self, and our, and we should be okay with our bodies because they quote unquote work. If we had a more connected understanding, um, if we built a world where it were it was impossible for our food to be produced um, under the framework or or of exploitation, how would that change then the way we think about food? Um, and I also wanted to, I guess, touch on um, the not, not only how the conditions through which food um, is produced, you know, outside of the home, but also in the home, in that food production um, and preparing the preparing of meals and the cooking of food and the um, and ingredients and so. Uh, fourth has always been kind of women's work right and there have been entire feminist genealogies that have um, rooted themselves thinking about wages for housework for example um, and the critiques of the wages for housework campaign that was launched by black feminists um, as well um, yeah those feminist genealogies have rooted themselves in attempting to unpick women's uh, attachment to the home right or, or the forced attachment to child rearing or or um, getting people to understand that that labor is labor and that labor is work and it should be recognized and compensated as such as it's you know a complicated thing um yeah I, I really wanted to um shine a light on that because I also think that um the food that we eat is is un, is not unconnected from who makes it um and this idea that actually um complicating the narrative of of healthy eating right by thinking about how the, the food that we have access to as people, it, it's especially where I live in London, is entirely dependent on a kind of postcode lottery, right? In that there are some people who are able to leave their homes and uh, provide um, and get a fresh produce. And there are other people whose, whose streets are littered with fish and chip shops and kebab shops, and that's it, right? And so it, I, I, what I was trying to do was unpick this idea that our bodies are about personal responsibility if we see them also as connected to the world that we're living in, and if we see them as products of the structures um, that we're living in, we soon realize um, that nobody has a monopoly on what is healthy, right? And that our whole conception of nutrition and health and well-being is very much based in fat phobia. It, it's based in the desire to be smaller. It's based in the way that we make the world um, harder to navigate for a fat people. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's what I kind of wanted to do with um, food. And I think it, it definitely connects to what you were saying in that a kind of radical and critical politics is always invested in understanding problems at their root. So with so starting with those agricultural workers, starting with the conditions in which our food is produced, that is what, you know, brings us to to be able to, I guess, think differently about the food that we eat. So, you know, throughout this conversation, something that, you know, you've both kind of repeatedly mentioned is genealogy and history. And, you know, Lola, you just mentioned wages for housework and kind of the pushback from other feminists at the time. So I did just want to ask you both, you know, what is, I guess, the relationship between, you know, black feminist history and our present moment? And, you know, what do these kind of genealogies of, you know, black feminist history have to kind of, uh, you know, tell us today, like how can we, um, I guess, stay connected within an intergenerational framework that, um, you know, seeks to end the world as we know it. Um, I'll, I'll let Lola answer that more at length because I think I addressed that um, in terms of connecting this present mm -hmm. moment and the many intersectional issues um, with black feminism. And, and that really is it. In addition to, to what I said, I would just add um, how uh, you know, I didn't mention that we're also finding a stronger need and purpose in art. Um, and because Black women for so long were denied um, access to educational institutions, to the workplace, and so on and so forth, um, art was always a, a, a method of resistance. Um, and so that is something that the Black feminist canon and the intellectual tradition of Black feminism also really lends itself to at the present moment. Um, yeah, I, I, just to continue that, I think that the way that I, I kind of think about black feminism is, is as an incredibly generative frame in that it's always shifting and moving and it's never fixed. And I think um, in terms of intergenerational conversation, I think it's really important to 
um, work hard at trying to have a dynamic relationship to the past, right? Uh, so a relationship where we remain critical, but also a relationship where, um, and a relationship where we understand how conditions have changed from the um, contemporary moment to um, from what we call the past, but also um, one that takes into account what we do have to learn from the ways that people have organized in the past. And I say that just even um, practically and on a strategic level. There are ways in, um, that, that people were able to form, especially if you're thinking about the UK organizations like OAD, um, the Bricks and Black Women's Group, and a whole myriad of kind of feminist organizations were able to build and form meaningful coalitions that, that kind of lasted and um, were the launching pad for a number of, of campaigns um, where people were assessing the conditions of their communities and recognizing that the state was not going to the, intervene, that the state in many ways did not care if certain communities lived or died. And so not only were they building and, and sustaining and providing for their own communities in, term, in terms of supplementary schools, in terms of political education, they were also finding ways to, to draw attention to um, uh, major problems um, in the way that they were living, to do with austerity, to do with police brutality, to do with um, gendered violence. Um, yeah, and so I think I think um, that there's maybe a way that we can often think of the past as, um, and I guess we apply the same logic to the archive as well, right? We think of the the archive in the past as this like static, fixed thing, right? That is contained in specific legitimized places and institutions. And I think it's it's much, um, in reality, it's much more fluid. And and a lot of the people that we consider, you know. Um, uh, great giants of the past are still with us, right? And so we have to contend with the ways that their politics shifts and changes and responds to this contemporary moment. I think for me, what, what I'm thinking about constantly is, is how technology and the advancement of technology, obviously, and, and the advancement of from that surveillance capital and surveillance from the state really changes the landscape in which, you know, feminist organizers are doing their work, right? And so I think that kind of techno-feminism, cyber-feminism offers us a lot in terms of trying to think about ways that we can be made obscure and, and um, kind of, uh, yeah, be made uh, so, so it's impossible for the state to kind of track us down because I think we're in incredibly tricky times in terms of how technology is being utilised by institutions and state bodies to keep an eye on radical organising. Thank you so much. Right, so we're going to move on to some audience questions. Um, and the first one actually really speaks to kind of what you've just been talking about, Lola, in terms of this idea of, you know, coalitions um, in terms of solidarity, which is also, you know, something that you explore in depth in your book. So uh, this is a question for both of you. So um, the question is, how can we try to bring feminists of every variety to work together despite their differences, respecting and learning from our differences without fighting over those differences? Um, I mean, I always say that a feminism is as much a, a project um, for sisterhood as it is against patriarchy, um, but for sisterhood in a kind of political way. Um, so coming together, not to all hold hands and sing kumbaya, and you know, it's it's fine if we don't necessarily um, gel with each other uh, on a one-to-one -one basis. But as long as we understand that, um, so long as we're not sort of battling against patriarchy together, whether it is um, within the UK or internationally in terms of global feminisms, um, then really it's, it becomes a moot project because for example, um, you know, Western patriarchies are built upon the global order, which is an order uh, where, where countries in the global South are exploited. Um, and so if we as, you know, we're, we are all black feminists, but we're also based in the West. And if Western feminisms are not looking at uh, challenging that global order, then they're not really looking at challenging patriarchy at its core. Um, but yes, I think it's, uh, you know, it, it's really interesting what Lala was talking about in terms of uh, the how not having a state that would provide for you and give you the safety and security that the state is supposed to provide its citizens was such a catalytic um, moment and, and thing for black feminisms in the past, which, and black feminisms are indeed, you know, very fluid, but it's, it's really interesting to consider that um, in this moment, in terms of coalition building, um, how, you know, the state has become so integral 
perhaps because liberal um, feminism is also the most popular type. And so there isn't really that, that sense of urgency that the state is not doing mm -hmm. what it's supposed to do. And, and so I think that one opportunity for, for building sisterhood, um, because this is something that, you know, surveillance capitalism affects all women um, pretty much equally in, in, in different variations, um, but really honing in on the uses of technology as, as, a, as a, a format, um, as a form of creating uh, coalition and, and sisterhood, political sisterhood. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really it's I find this question always really interesting because I think it it comes from this place of understanding um, powerful movements as unified movements, but also understanding unity meaning sameness, right? So it's always it's always framed within the language of overcoming difference rather than thinking of difference as the very like texture that makes the coalition possible, right? And so, yeah, so, um, I, I think about Audre Lorde, who's the great, you know, writer on difference. And I think about how her work has been co-opted for a, a specific neoliberal agenda. But I also think that if you return to it, what, what are the, at the core maybe she's arguing for is a recog uh, not, not an elision of difference in any way, but rather a recognition that our, our movements have never been unified. There are people who call themselves feminists with whom I don't share a political project, but our movements have always kind of been um, in ways defined by conflict. And that's okay because conflict is generative. Conflict throws up new ideas. It makes us question um, uh, old ways of being, old you know, frameworks of knowledge, et cetera. It is what I think sustains our movements more than this idea of like, oh, we just need to recognize that we're all kind of working for the same goal because in many ways we're not. And so this progress that we, that we envisage, right, has to, we have to kind of begin to dismantle it as a linear, straightforward narrative. We have to think of progress as happening in a million different places at once, as always, always multifaceted, as always, you know, um, uh, simultaneously connected and disconnected. And I, I don't know, that's a, that's a very hard, obviously, uh, idea to hold in your head when you have very clear, like, aims. Maybe your aim is a change in state policy or your aim is a change in, you know, whatever. But I think for me, that's what that's what keeps me interested in um, feminism and not getting bogged down in this idea of like, oh, we all disagree. We've always all disagreed. Um, and that's what's really, you know, created the space for new ideas. Yeah. No, I remember, I you know, in your chapter about, um, you know, art for art's sake and kind of arguing against that, Lola, I know that you had a conversation with Montaz and Marie. Mm -mm. There's something like, oh, I love artistic beef. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. One of my favorite. I love fighting. Like, yeah, it's really interesting. <laughs> like, I love that. So, yeah, no, I love that idea of like conflict being generative and also mm -mm. being to this mm. idea, you know, kind of ending the world of kind of, you know, reimagining what we are able to do. Um, and also how, you know, new ways to kind of be in conversation with each other and kind of learn mm -hmm. each other. So um, I've got a next question for you both. So um, the question is, what are some of the actions we can take to insist that the feminist conversation be anti-capitalist and anti-imperialist? What do um, actions look like for the feminists in the imperialist centers of the world that necessarily live off the historical and current exploitation and surplus from the economic periphery. So I know you kind of touched on that, Mina, just a, a moment ago, so. Yeah, yeah um, I think it's really interesting insofar as black feminism is concerned, um, because right now there are so many I would argue that black feminism is a, it's quite solid at the moment. It's something that exists in the discourse. You know, people are relatively aware of the different concepts that exist within it. And so what we're also seeing is that there are multiple strands of black feminism that you can, you can, you can now start to define them in ways that we wouldn't have been able to um, 20 years ago, or maybe even 10 or five years ago. Um, so we do have like, a kind of liberal black feminism emerging largely via popular culture. Um, you know, you have um, the, the radical black feminists, obviously. Um, there's, there's just kind of different strands. Afrofuturism is impacting the black feminist movement as well. And so um, it's, it's very interesting to think about for me um, how this, this phase of black feminists discourse, it's super exciting because there's all this kind of 
uh, reinvention and imagination taking place. Um, but of course, at the same time, there is a tension. Um, there always has to be a tension when things are, are evolving and growing so rapidly. And that is that the core um, of black feminism, which is anti-capitalism, uh, anti-imperialism, um, you know, these are, are fundamental core elements of black feminism have always been. Um, but of course, now that we have these new newish, uh, you know, strands of black feminism emerging, I, 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 I want to respond to that question that we have to, um, we kind of have to observe a little bit. I don't think we can, um, we can forcefully say to, to other black feminist groups that are, are you know, if, if, if we're looking at in popular culture, um, you know, the, you know, Nicki Minaj's and uh, Beyonce and people like that who are um, doing important feminist work, but they're certainly not anti-imperialist or anti-capitalist, you know, and, and, and there needs to be a space um, for those black feminisms as well. Um, but at the same time, I mean, I certainly position myself with that kind of core black feminist message. And, um, and I think, or what I would hope is that that doesn't get lost, you know, entirely, that there isn't an acknowledgement of that in the work that we do, but in a kind of way that still uh, opens up space rather than closes down space, because we live in times where um, space is being closed a lot. Um, and, I, and I think that one, one important facet of, of all feminist work needs to be to open up space for dialogue. Um, I think that, yeah, this is a really, really hard and, and very necessary question. I think for me, um, thinking about how we kind of stay connected, um, I think it's what's really important is a refusal to kind of capitulate to the border, if that makes sense, in our understanding of, um, of how we're envisaging freedom. And so freedom isn't, isn't just contained within our local context. We have to care about other people outside of, you know, um, the imperial core and the imperial con um, center. And by care, I don't mean a kind of, you know, facile, superficial politics that's, that, that is about like the comparing of plights. I mean, we have to get back to what what um, was central to feminist movements in the global south and um, in Europe, it, radical feminist movements, which is you know a socialist, uh, a communitarian kind of Marxist approach, which is looking at um, the ways in which those chains of exploitations um, exploitation works, and that means reassessing, um, you know how we get our food, how we how our clothes are made, um, our over-reliance on certain kind of corporations, how, you know, the gadgets that we use are made, et cetera. And I, I feel like sometimes that, that feels like a very kind of simpl simplistic answer. But I think at its core, it's about thinking um, and acknowledging the ways that um, the, the freedom that we're envisaging requires us to give something up, right? And so we have to refuse to, to turn a blind eye to the ways um, uh, that our lives are made possible by the exploitation of other people. We have to refuse to kind of naturalize the exploitation of someone else in, in our success. And that means, I think, reimagining wholly what it means to have a quote unquote good life and what it means to be quote unquote successful where we are in our context. Um, yeah, and, and you know, what Mina was saying about the different kind of uh, feminisms battling out, um, I think this is why, you know, conflict, conflict is so important and this idea that we don't, often we don't share the same vision. And so we, we're gonna have to leave some people behind, right? Because, you know, we can't, you know, um, a claim to care about the plight of people who are making Beyonce's clothes and then, you know, uh, refuse to, to to mount a critique of her athleisure line or whatever. I think it, it's about undoing our attachment to these ideas of um, luxury and these ideas of like, oh, okay, there's nothing, nothing can be done about X, Y, Z. Uh, and so um, uh, we won't say anything. O obviously it's much, much deeper and more complicated um, than that, but I think it really starts there. Thank you. I think a lot of that, if I can jump in is, um, is you know going back to the very beginning of what I was saying of trying to of creating a change that is um, an inward awakening mm -hmm. as well as a, a radical politicization mm -hmm. or political radicalization. Mm -hmm. um, and if I, I'm going to see if I can make sense of this. 
quite um, abstract metaphor, but um, I was thinking earlier today about how um, plastic is something that, um, you know, when, when we look at uh, within cl climate change discussions, there's obviously this um, rejection of all the plastic that is produced for very valid reasons, but there's very little conversation about how, um, you know, people value things that are expensive and have been handcrafted for a very long time. But ultimately, if we're going to do away with like the overconsumption of plastic, we have to get people to also just be OK with one plastic cup and to value that, even though it only costs them a pound versus, you know, their their crystal that costs them a lot of money. And I think it's a similar kind of thing here. Um, sounds a bit far fetched, but with um, feminism is, you know, rather than just critiquing, I think we have to to get deep into the place where people can really clearly understand that that kind of production method and consumption method that leads to a type of feminism that is uh, that lacks critical thinking toward the condition um, of all women and the freedom for all women, um, it has to really become more inward. And that's why I say we need to open space because I think that is where we can, we can, we shouldn't um, leave those women behind, I would argue, that feel that that is, is okay. Rather, we should seek to convert them um, from, from an inward and a political sense. Thank you both so much for such a beautiful uh, discussion. I feel like just kind of imbued in a kind of, you know, black feminist politic that, that is definitely gonna kind of carry me through um, and help me write, hopefully. For, yes. Thank you so much for sharing, Jade. This is wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. I want to um, say thank you again to Edinburgh International Book Festival. Um, both Minna and Lola's beautiful books are available to buy at the Edinburgh Book Festival shop. So you can get that at shop.edbookfest.co.uk. And uh, there should be on your screen a little donation box. So if you have you know, enjoyed tonight's discussion and all of the rest of the events at Edinburgh Book Fest, please do feel free to donate a little something. So thank you so much to both of you and have a lovely rest of your evening. Thank you.